Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to today's SETI talk. Our speaker today is Tuguldor Sukbold. Uh, Tuguldor was educated at the University of Arizona and also at the University of California, Santa Cruz, just down the road. Uh, he, in fact, is finishing up his uh, doctoral research there under the supervision of Stan Woolsey. Uh, he, in fact, defends his PhD on Friday, so we're uh, very grateful that he uh, has uh, come down here to uh, join us in the meantime. And uh, hopefully this will be more of a decompressing activity than, uh, uh, you know, an extra stress for the week. Um, uh, to Guldor, uh, after he finishes up uh, here at uh, Santa Cruz, we'll be going on to a postdoc at Ohio State University. So we uh, look forward to continuing to see great things from him. Uh, his topic today is ev evolution and explosion of massive stars. So let's welcome to Guldor Sukbold. All right, can everybody hear me? All right, uh, first of all, thanks everyone for coming here. And it's really great. You know, I, I grew up in Mongolia, and it's, you know, it's really a rural country. And as a kid, you know, I watched the movie Contact. You know, I learned about Jill Tarter and SETI. And so in many ways, it's kind of surreal you know, to be here and giving a talk at the Institute. Um, so today, I'll be giving a talk about my, uh, essentially, thesis research. Not all of it, but a good portion of it. It's on the investigating the uh, all kinds of uh, aspects of the evolution and explosion of massive stars. And said so Stan Woosley is a, a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's my advisor, and this a lot of this work was also done in collaboration with all these great people, including uh, Dr. Justin Brown, who was uh, oh, oh sorry, I guess this is the laser. There you go. Uh, Justin Brown, who is my fellow student, who recently defended last month. And we closely collaborated with people at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Garching, Germany. And there we have uh, Professor Thomas Janka and his students, Thomas Ertl and Marcelo Ugliana. All right. So massive stars, you know, uh, stars in general are, you know, the main baryonic building block, blocks of the universe. So they're, of course, you know, important in everything. But because of the, the way the massive stars are born, because of the top heavy nature of the initial mass function, you know, in the universe, you have a lot of small stars and very few massive stars. However, despite their few number, the massive stars play a very disproportionately important role in the general dynamic and chemical evolution of the galaxies. And therefore, you know, influencing galaxies, they influence the universe as a whole, too. And just to mention a few of its amazing effects is the ionizing radiation. They create the heavy elements. And as Carl Sagan said, you know, we're all sitting in this room in some ways, thanks to massive stars. And they explode as supernovae. And when they explode, they stir up the interstellar medium in the galaxies. And then when they leave, they often, uh, uh, I mean, when they die, they often leave these uh, exotic remnants, such as neutron stars and black holes. So studying and understanding them is a really important deal in astrophysics. However, despite their, you know, they're playing a crucial role in all kinds of astrophysical contexts, over you know, half a century worth of effort still is not quite there yet to fully understand how these guys are evolving and how these guys are dying. And there are a lot of problems. And if I had to say like three big problems is these three things. So when the stars evolve, there's a lot of these uncertain pieces of physics that we still don't understand. So one of them is convective mixing is when you know, there's a convective episode going on in the sun. How the material mixes, on, especially on the borders of the convective zones is very uh, not well understood. And there's mass loss, you know, stars lose lots of mass, especially massive stars lose lots of mass as it evolves through its life. And that's also very badly understood. And finally, the explosion mechanism, that's like still is kind of an open problem. And just to give you an idea, the, you know, when I say massive stars, like what kind of stars do I exactly mean? Um, in terms of the lowest end, uh, the massive stars need to be massive enough to explode as supernovae, okay? So that mass is roughly, today is believed to be around eight solar masses. So around eight solar masses, every star above it essentially explodes as supernovae. Stars below, they die as AGB stars embedded, you know, I mean, uh, they evolve as AGB stars and they die as white dwarfs embedded in uh, planetary nebulae. And as you go up in mass, how big can massive star be? And that's, uh, again, another open question. It's uh, really fascinating. Uh, you know, it can go up, like the theoretical models in today's understanding of astrophysics would say like, you know, it can go up to 120 times the mass of the sun. 
but there are some observational evidence that there may be stars as big as 300 solar masses. So like the star cluster here in the Large Magellanic Cloud you know, has one of the largest stars uh, known to human, uh, known to us right now, and, uh, and some of them are truly big. So there's there definitely discrepancy there. And depend the, uh, it's not just the mass in the current epoch where we have the solar metallicity. If you go back into uh, early universe when there was less metals, the stars couldn't lose a lot of mass and they could have been way, way bigger. Like they could have been many thousand times the mass of the sun. So those guys, in general, these very big stars are very exotic. They're very rare. And I just want to make sure that my talk is focused on mostly, uh, you know, platonic, like regular stars, okay, from 8 to 100 solar mass. I don't deal with anything, the crazy exotic stars. All right. And a lot of my uh, research is focused on this newly emerging idea called the islands of explosions. Okay, so to illustrate that, here I'm plotting the essentially just one axis of initial mass. Okay, and here I have eight solar mass. That's the smallest mass that can explode as a supernova. And there was a, for a long time there was this conventional notion that you know the difficulty of explosion scales with initial mass. So at eight solar mass, this is your easiest start to explode. But as you go up in mass, high in mass, initial mass, essentially the difficulty gets more and more, and eventually you reach a point around 20 solar mass where above you can't really explode any stars. They just, they, the thing becomes too difficult to explode. So they, for a long time they thought, okay, these stars explode and create neutron stars and all the heavier stars, they don't explode. Instead, they implode and create massive black holes. Okay, but the newly emerging picture in the past few years more actively is that maybe the reality is not that simple, but it's maybe it's more like this. So instead of having just one mass, like separating explosion from implosion, you have, I mean, uh, for the lightest end is usually, they all almost always explode. But you go, as you go up to closer to the 20, there are a lot of these islands and there are gaps. And the stars very close to each other initial mass, they can sometimes can have very different fates. And not just that, as you go up in mass way above 20, there might be other islands of explosions. So even these bigger stars, when we thought never would explode, they might actually you know, uh, end up exploding. So and this is, has important consequences because you know, as the star explodes, explodes, that's the only way it uh, sheds back its chemically enriched material back into the interstellar medium. So if all the stars, stars, if the stars never exploded, you know, again, we wouldn't be here. All right, so to, my research is really then focused on understanding why this has this kind of structure, why this is non-monotonic. You know, why the explosions are not just why it's not like simple like this. And not just we try to explain this, we also take a step further and assume this is true, uh, then we investigate what kind of explosion results we would get from this scenario. And to really understand, I'm sorry, don't freak out, you know, it's, I know it's a complicated graph, but you won't, uh, just wait till you see the real one, which is much more complicated. <laughs> so, to understand this question, we really need to have some kind of intuition about how the stars evolve. So just to give you guys some help, I created this uh, toy diagram. It's what's called a keep in hand diagram. It's a convection plot. It shows the uh, structural evolution of a given star as a function of time, okay? So what you have on the y-axis is the center of the star. Here's the surface, and this is the time. So time is kind of plotted in a funny way. It's the log of the time until its death, okay? So the stars die around here. They're born here. So when it dies, you know, this is the last day of its life. This is last month. This is last year, etc. Okay? So it's the log of the time until it's death. And these shaded regions are the convective regions. Okay? And different elements are the main fuels are burning in these regions. So basically when the star is born, you know, it burns hydrogen like our sun. Okay? Even the massive stars also burn hydrogen. And that's where it spends most of its life. So it spends like tens of millions of years burning just hydrogen. The structure is rather simple. You have a convective hydrogen core, just burning, burning, and the convection replenishes the fuel. And you have a radiative region, and there's the surface of the star. But, but this is kind of plotted in a mass. Don't think of it in a radius. It's kind of Lagrangian coordinate. And then once it finishes hydrogen in the core, uh, the core shrinks to ignite the next fuel, which is helium. But as the core shrinks, the hydrogen ignites in the shell region, okay? So once hydrogen ignites in the shell region, in the radius coordinate, it swells up the envelope. The envelope becomes very extended and the star becomes a red supergiant. But in the mass coordinate, a lot of mass loss happens during this phase. 
Okay, so during this phase, the uh, core helium burns in the core. And once the helium burning is finished, helium sh shell ignites. And while this helium shell ignites, you still have the hydrogen shell going, and that thing lasts until the end of, the li end of its life. And helium shell will also last until the end of its life. And after helium, you have carbon. And notice that instead of just one big bulky convective episode, carbon burns in a small core and then followed by consecutive, three consecutive shells. And as I will show you, this is absolutely nothing unique for massive stars because they can have absolutely crazy structures. Like instead of a convective core, you can have a radiative flame going up and this number of shells and their locations, they can all change. And this is actually the key why stars end up monotonic. So you notice that the evolution around here and here is pretty simple, right? You have just this nice symmetric structure, but as you go from here on, things get really crazy. So after carbon, you have neon burning, oxygen burning, and silicon burning. So basically at the end of its life, you know, you have this multiple shell burning episodes going on at the same time, and then you have an inert iron core. And of course you can't, after creating iron core, you can't burn further, so this core has to collapse under its own weight. Sorry. So this would represent roughly a 15 solar mass solar metallicity star, okay? And so this region, as I said, is really the key to understanding the non-monotonic part, and this evolution is called the advanced stages, okay? So the reason, they're called advanced for a reason. And the reason, uh, the big thing about the advanced stages is this is the time where the neutrino losses become uh, very important in the evolution. So, you know, when the stars burn these elements, you know, there are reactions that release neutrinos, but the neutrinos are very weakly interactive particles, so they just rob away energy. But the star needs energy to fight the gravity, right? So once the neutrino losses become very important, the star has to burn very fast, you know, they have to burn very rigorously and heavy, heavy fuels. So that's why the stages are very chaotic. And here I'm showing the neutrino luminosity at roughly these different stages as the log of the valley, and you notice that during the hydrogen and helium, it's in around 30 something, but then during advanced stages, it just you know, goes up crazy. It's, again, this is the log. And another thing to note that important thing about the evolution is notice the radius of the star, okay? So it's in units of 10 to the 13 centimeters. And you notice that at the main sequence, it's a, in a pretty small star. And then during the hel core helium burning, it becomes a red supergiant, so it swells up a lot, right? So from uh, you know, 10 to the 11, a few times 10 to the 11 centimeters, it swells up to four times 10 to the 13, so a factor of 100. But then after that, it doesn't swell up much, but notice that during the advanced stages, it's essentially frozen. The radius doesn't change at all. And this is a very important feature of the star because the reason why the radius and actually the temperature also doesn't change is because you know, the envelope essentially is decoupled from the evolution of the core. So the core evolves very fast and the information of things changing in the core doesn't travel through the envelope. The kelvin helmholtz time scale, the thermal time scale of the envelope is on the order of many thousand years. But you notice that the longest burning fuel in the advanced stages is, you know, burns in a time scale of thousand years. So basically these things happen very quickly, but all the rest of the star just doesn't have time to adjust, okay? All right, so the stars evolve in a similar fashion now, and then at this stage, it's called the pre-supernova stage, you have an iron core, and eventually it will collapse. And just give you a schematics of the collapse. So this is kind of a zoomed-in version of this region of the star. So you have the iron core is collapsing in a silicon shell, and the reason it's collapsing is because an iron core is mostly supported by electron, electron degeneracy, and as the uh, sh silicon shell burning dumps more iron into the iron core, the mass increases and essentially eventually exceeds the uh, Chandrasekhar mass and then starts to collapse. And here's a rundown of the central density during its collapse. Um, at the pre-supernova, the central density is on the order of 10 to the 10 grams per cc. It's super dense already. But then when it starts to collapse, it will become, increase even more denser and and it also collapsed much more faster. And part of the reason is very, very interesting, this reaction, where as it starts to collapse, this free protons capture electrons and release neutrons and uh, electron neutrinos. Okay, so these are neutrinos. So what happens is there are two important effects that are affecting this collapse. So this reaction removes the electrons from the core. So electrons, they provide the degeneracy pressure. So they actually remove the pressure, so the collapse has to go faster. 
but also the neutrinos you know, effectively escape the infinity. So they also rub the energy, so the collapse has to go very fast. Okay, and then eventually you reach the central density of 10 to the 12, and this reaction effectively stops because the neutrinos get trapped. But you know, the collapse becomes just very, very fast. So the speed of the collapse at the uh, innermost or fastest region reaches quarter of the speed of light. And the whole thing just happens in a dynamical time scale on this density, which is like a fraction of a second. So the whole collapse happens in a 1.1 second, essentially. Okay? And the whole thing collapses and eventually reaches the nuclear density, a few times 10 to the 14 uh, grams per centimeter cube. And you know, there's going to be a big bounce. The whole collapse comes to a screeching halt. There will be a massive, uh, powerful sound wave will form at the center and will start going out. Okay? And historically, for a long time, people thought that this sound wave that formed at the nuclear density is actually maybe what explodes the stars. So they thought, okay, the star you know, runs out of fuel, collapses, and goes to nuclear density and bounces back, and maybe that's how stars explode. And that was the thought kind of in the earlier, in the last century. But then later times in the 1980s, people uh, realized that that's actually not the case. Uh, and what happens is when the shock tries to go out, there are two processes start to play. So the you know, shock bounced back. And as the shock tries to go out, there's this accretion going on from the, all the external outside matters of shell. And the two processes are the photodissociation and neutrino loss is essentially uh, this reaction starts to play back, roll again, and starts robbing energy from the shock. And the shock has to stall. And now we know for a fact that for typical stellar explosions, the shock stalls after only traveling about 100 kilometers. So the critical piece uh, in this problem of stellar explosion is to, you need to have some way of reviving this shock. If you don't revive and give some energy somehow to this shock and explode the star, that's the only way to explode the star. Otherwise, the whole star is going to just implode. Okay? And the kind of a front-running idea in this problem today is the neutrino-driven, uh, neutrino heating mechanism. And I just want to clarify because it's kind of an open problem. Now, I didn't put it on a slide for a reason. Because the open problem, um, the neutrino-driven heating, when I say it's a front-running idea, it's only for the typical stellar explosions, OK? But we have these hyper-energetic explosions. Those are you know, totally different beasts. And neutrino heating probably can explain those. And the core idea of the uh, neutrino heating mechanism is that you know, as the star collapses and you know, there's a bounce shock forms, the most part of the, what was previously iron core becomes a proto-neutron star. And as, as the iron core becomes a proto-neutron star, it will release almost in, uh, its entire gravitational binding energy in terms of neutrinos. Okay, so the gravitational binding energy of the iron core is on the order of 10 to the 53 ergs. It's a lot of energy, and it almost exclusively comes out neutrinos. But when you observe supernovae, the typical energies are on the order of 10 to the 51 ergs. Okay, so this neutrino heating mechanism really asks the, you know, the nature to give just 1% of its energy budget, and that will explode the star. So the idea is that you know, as the proto-neutron star you know, cools and contracts and emits the neutrinos, uh, the, only uh, some fraction will get coupled with the matter behind the shock, and then it will just give just enough energy to drive the shock outward and uh, make the explosion happen. All right, so there's... Stars not just only evolve in structure, the important thing is they you know, evolve the composition. And uh, there are a lot of, in general, it's uh, the reactions that can take place inside a star are like, extremely complicated, especially like, during the advanced stages. But here's kind of a general rundown of what kind of fuels are burning and creating what. Okay? So here I have the fuel, uh, and then main ashes, the central temperature, roughly when this happens, and then the main reactions. Okay, so I think I shouldn't really spend uh, too much time on this. Okay, so basically, you know, uh, hydrogen burns into helium, helium burns into carbon oxygen. As you go up higher masses, you know, there are more exotic reactions, and these are just primary reactions. Bes beside these, there are a bunch of secondary reactions. So it's just very complicated, okay? And uh, beside the pre supernova nucleosynthesis, when the star dies, there's also explosive nucleosynthesis. So when the star dies, the shock wave gets propagated outwards. And then when the shock wave hits the ejected material to four and a half, four, four to five billion kelvins, then the silicon in the ejector will burn explosively. And two to four kelvins, then the 
neon carbon will burn explosively, et cetera. And there, during the explosions, there are neutrino process, P process, I mean, gamma process, there are all kinds of different processes that can essentially enrich the uh, possibilities of the nucleus synthesis. All right, and finally, uh, light curves. So these stars explode and they create this fascinating fireworks. Uh, they have been kind of mainstays of supernova research for a long time. And generally, uh, you know, because of the different configurations, you can have different progenitors, you know, different composition, mass of the progenitor in different environments. The diversity is like extremely rich. And they're powered by different, all kinds of different uh, energy sources. But the most important energy source that exists in all of the uh, supernova explosions powers the light curve, but uh, is essentially the radioactivity. But it exists in all, of, essentially all of the explosions, but it's not the dominant one for all of them, okay? And the main player in radioactivity is the decay of nickel-56. It's created during the explosive silicon burning during the explosion. And it decays into cobalt-56 in 6.1 days, which decays into iron-56 in 77.3 days. With, these are half-lives. And so this is the kind of main, uh, one of the main sources. But then beside this, you can have all kinds of secondary sources, like the uh, collision. If you have a lot of matter outside the stellar explosion, you can have uh, collisions uh, powering the ejecta. And also the, um, the compact remnants, the neutron stars and black holes can also inject energy into the ejecta. And you can have uh, recombination of ionized matter. So you know, there are all kinds of possibilities. Uh, but the, the two important types that are relevant for my research are these two uh, light, curve, light curves. Uh, light curve type 2P, P stands for plateau. So the, this is the light curve. You have a luminosity as a function of time. It has this sharp peak, and then it stays roughly constant for uh, about three months, and then it decays into a tail. And the plateau is really referring to this region where the luminosity stays constant for quite a long time. And so this uh, kind of, this is, the most common light curve, you can say that this is, emerges from the almost 80% of all the supernova are, you know, explode as type 2P supernovae. And it has basically three segments. And this first segment is the, when the initial shock wave pro propagates and then breaks out from the surface of the star, okay? And this happens very quickly on the time scale of just a few dozen minutes, essentially. Then as the ejecta cools, expands and cools, and it comes down to temperature about 6,000 Kelvin or so. The hydrogen that was in the envelope of the progenitor star, uh, which was ionized by the shock, which then get recombined. And the recombination that travels kind of as a wave in mass inward, so it, it maintains this constant temperature for a long time. And once the photosphere essentially uh, uh, reaches at the bottom of the core of the ejecta, then the uh, plateau dies off, and then the luminosity sharply declines, and then this last part is solely poured by radioactivity, okay? And the other important type is uh, type 1 BC. Uh, type 1 BCs are results of stars that are exploding. Uh, by the way, I just want to make sure that these stars are, these type 2Ps emerge exclusively from stars that have hydrogen envelopes, extended hydrogen envelopes. If you don't have this hydrogen envelope, you're not going to have this plateau. Instead, you'll get something like this, okay? So these are basically explosions of uh, naked helium and carbon oxygen cores. These stars would uh, result from like the very massive stars that lose all of its envelope during its evolution, and they just die as just bare helium and carbon oxygen cores. And the light curve is rather simple, you know, just rise up and die, and the time scale for the peak is roughly 20 days. And you can see that they're very different. All right, just want to say a quick mention of the main tool that we use in our study. It's called the Kepler Code. Uh, it's written in, back in 1978. It's almost 40 years old, and it's been used for this kind of research for a long time. Okay, so I just tried to list major papers, and I eventually gave up. There's just so many. Uh, it's a one-dimensional implicit Lagrangian hydrodynamic code. Uh, it can uh, evolve the star stellar evolution, including its mass loss, you know, convection, rotation, nucleus synthesis, and all the important pieces of physics. And just the main advantage over this, there are many other codes like this, you know, they can do evolve the star and explode the star, but the main advantage is uh, because it's a hydro code and also because it can carry a very large nucleus synthetic network and uh, also it has also these two things, the piston scheme and the flux limited diffusion, they're just fancy words for certain pieces of physics where it allows the code to explode uh, 
explore all kinds of uh, supernovae. Okay, so it can essentially calculate models for isotropic explosions, uh, symmetric explosions for all kinds of supernovae. All right, so now we're kind of going to the main science part. So people knew for a long time that the uh, difficulty of explosion is really depends on the structure of the, uh, the very core structure of the pre-supernova star. The outside envelope, that thing doesn't really matter. So the structure can have very, you can have very compact, you know, not much matter, just very compact, very condensed, or you can have very extended, heavy core, okay? So when it's extended, heavy core, as you can imagine, it's intuitively harder to explode, but if it's compact, it's easier, okay? So just to visualize and plot it here, the density profile of several models with the different initial masses, and as you can see, for nine solar mass, the density profile you know, goes up here and then drops down very sharply. And there's basically the matter outside. This part is just very light stuff. But if you go to heavier stars, you notice that the density doesn't drop off sharply. You know, it stays, the profile is very shallow and extended. And basically, so people knew that you know, stars with this kind of prof profile are harder to explode, and these guys are easier to explode. And by the way, this is only showing the innermost four solar masses. And so one way to characterize this uh, part of the star is uh, it's called a compactness parameter. It's basically inverse of the radius enclosing a certain piece of mass, and it's given in units of 1,000 kilometers. And this was uh, first suggested by researchers at the uh, Caltech back in 2011. And the mass is usually taken as two and a half solar mass. So, so the stashed lines are two and a half. So basically, it's the inverse of the radius enclosing this much mass for different models, okay? And we run many hundred models, uh, actually 200 models between eight and 120 solar masses. And then when we calculate this parameter for each of them, and then when we plot the results, are looks like this. Okay, so that means, you know, like a lot of, whenever this parameter is high, that means the profile is extended, the star is harder to explode. Whenever the value is low, the profile is like this, you know, very, you know, shallow, uh, sharp drop off, and they're easy to explode. But the key thing is, you know, notice that it, it doesn't just monotonically increase. You know, the star just doesn't get become harder to explode as you go up in the initial mass. But instead, they're just up and downs. There are a bunch of, you know, crazy, almost chaotically varying regions. And so people knew, kind of knew that this was the case. And you know, they ran a few models and they noticed that it's just not a simple straight line. But they didn't know, uh, didn't knew quite well, like all the uh, fine details and the fine structure. There are like two very distinct bumps, and there's this chaotic region. And these guys are being super, super low, and the very high masses are also become low again. So, the my quest for my PhD really started trying to explain this um, uh, graph, essentially why exactly this thing is not monotonic. Okay, so to understand this, of course, we need to look at the real Kippenan diagram. Uh, as a, so this is the real one of the previous uh, simple one I showed you before. So this is for a 15 solar mass star, and now it's showing uh, inner eight solar masses, okay? So the star is actually extends way up. And also notice that for the time, uh, it doesn't show much of the main sequence. It's really focused on the advanced stages, and you can have, a, you have the helium burning here. And what I'm gonna show you now is, I'm gonna show the series of same plots, but I, I'm gonna increase the mass of the star. Okay, and I want you to notice the certain uh, characteristics. And the reason why I'm doing this is just trying to convince you that the, the evolution that you see experience in this part of the star is really what makes it uh, non-monotonic. So as, as I go up in mass, you'll notice that the hydrogen core will uh, go up, and after the hydrogen core, the helium core will go up because with bigger mass stars, you have just bigger cores. But as things go up with bigger mass, these things don't just like get bigger and bigger and bigger. It just becomes very complicated. And you see 18? So 18 and 15 are fairly similar, okay? But I go to 20, you notice that what's, oh, oh crap, sorry. Notice what's happened here. So carbon was burning in this con consecutive convective sh uh, episodes, but then at 20, you don't have a convective episode here. It burns as a radiative flame. And as you go up to 23, Notice how things are changing. And 27 becomes very different. Again, at 30, it's also very different. Sorry, I'm sweating a lot. <laughs> um, so the main, 
so we really studied this kind of uh, details for nearly two years. And the main thing that we find is that basically the modulation of the convective shell episodes and the kind of the car burnings of different uh, fuels is essentially what's driving the uh, non-monotonic feature. And uh, just to give you on the time of the evolution, we studied how that non-monotonic is cr created as a, uh, as a function of time, okay? So when the star is being born, you plot that uh, compactness parameter as a function of all those 200 uh, stars, you'll just see a flat line. There's no bumps and nothing. And it actually stays flat until about this time in the evolution. And the reason is because the, all the evolution until this time in the core is you know, pretty simple. It's not degenerate. But as you start going to advanced stages uh, during the carbon burning and oxygen, core oxygen burning, the first peak starts to form uh, for lighter stars. Okay, so that you remember there are two peaks in the compactness parameter. And it's during the oxygen burning and silicon burning, the second peak starts to form at you know, heavier stars. And then the evolution afterwards creates a lot of these fine details. But essentially the point is, uh, up, on, up, up to this point, if you understand how stars are evolving up to this point, you essentially understand why this thing is non-monotonic. And then we also found that the, this parameter correlates extremely well with the degeneracy and also the extent and timing of uh, different uh, shell episode burnings. And there, there are a lot of uh, pieces that put together and explain the non-monotonicity, non but and to just give you a taste of what it's like, I'm gonna try to explain in simple terms why these two different peaks form, okay? So imagine uh, this is the kind of a same Kip and Ann diagram, but it's just you know, simple uh, drawings. So you have some, I'm not gonna specify, just some certain fuel burns in a shell, okay? You might have uh, another convective episode before or carbon flame before, and it doesn't matter. So one shell burns here, and then as it burns, it's gonna f finish all the fuel you know, in this region, right? And then once it's finished, the next shell appears, uh, base is located at the extent of the previous one, and then burns here. And the next fuel, uh, in terms of weight, ignites in the core, right? But notice that the next fuel uh, doesn't start here. It's, it have to wait until there's enough mass of matter, and then so that it can start to ignite, and then you know, do, do its thing. But as you go in higher mass models, what's happened is, you know, this shell start to migrate upwards, and this shell is slightly higher, and this guy's everything slightly higher, but notice that this is not higher. So this shell is modulating this guy, basically creating a, uh, you know, kind of this indirect effect where it basically having a way to control the size and the timing of this burning episode. And the reason it does is because during the advanced stages, stars are very degenerate. So the, the idea of uh, Chandrasekhar mass starts to have some approximate meaning. And basically when the shell exceeds roughly 1.4 solar masses, you know, the star, uh, you know, the, the matter below this shell starts to ignite as an effectively smaller core, okay? And as you go to ever, ever higher mass, shells keep on going up, but you notice that as it goes further up, its relevance becomes less and less. So the convective oxygen, uh, I'm sorry, not oxygen, the convective episode starts to grow again and starts to uh, ignite at, at a later time, not early. So you notice that there's this kind of a rising thing and then going down and then rising thing again. And this is important because the this extent of this core burning episode for the oxygen and silicon uh, correlates with the compactness very well. So if you understand how the sizes of these uh, convective regions change, you essentially understand how this non-monotonicity non is uh, coming about. So it turns out there are two different cases where this mechanism works in the massive star evolution. And one is when the carbon convective shell uh, modulates the oxygen convective core burning. Okay, so notice that the base, so this is the location plotted as a function of different mass models. And as the shell goes out, it passes, you know, as the shell goes out, initially the oxygen core is just increasing in size, it's following. But then as the shell exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit, the core starts to recede during this thing. And then eventually at some point, the, the shell just so way high, it doesn't really affect the core burning episode, so it starts to go up again. And the similar thing here happens again later, but for oxygen shell modulating a silicon burning core, okay? And again, the, the oxygen shell as it exceeds the 1.4 solar mass, 
the silicon core peaks in size and then declines and then goes up again. So this is how the two peaks in the compactness curve are essentially created at like uh, different mass ranges from 20 to 30 and from 30 to 65. All right, so it's just that, that was just, uh, just to give you a taste of what's going on. Uh, but the real you know, details are, of course, much more complicated. Uh, so like, for example, the stars that are here are, they have this very low compactness because they have this very degenerate white dwarf-like structure in the core. So these stars are really like white dwarf stars, very degenerate complex stars embedded in a very extended envelope. Okay, these guys are always easy to explode. But then it goes up, then you have this craziness, and so you find that craziness is really related in the last day of burning of uh, silicon, oxygen, and carbon in shell. So those shells can burn together or split, and that creates uh, this very chaotic behavior here. And then this first peak, as I just said, is the modulation between carbon shell and oxygen core, and the second peak is oxygen shell and silicon core. And then finally, these stars, again, end up being with the small compactness is because they lose a lot of mass. So they lose so much mass that effectively they become similar to these smaller stars structurally. Okay? And after we thought we understand this thing, we just want to make sure that this is really a robust uh, feature. And so we tested uh, in terms of all the uncertainties, uncertain things in the stellar physics, like the convection physics, there's mass loss, different reaction rates, and we check on the resolution of the calculation with the timing and zoning. And we also tried with different code. And even though it's not published in the actual paper, I went on trying with different compiler flags. And you know, but the, the main idea is you know, things change. Okay, when you change things, of course, all these points move around. But the main uh, point, point I, I want to make is that even though these points move around, this general structure of these two hills, they doesn't go away. So the mass where they happen, of course, changes up and down by a solar mass or two. But this general structure stays very consistent. And then the, this previous uh, this modulation of uh, different burning episodes, that exactly happens everywhere, okay? So we take a step further, uh, believing, okay, maybe this is, again, just to confirm for non-scientists, so this is all theory, okay? This is absolutely nothing observational here. I don't know if this is what stars do, but I believe in it. Uh, but so we believe this is really what stars do, and then we want to explore, okay, if this is really the case, what's the explosion outcomes? And we do the explosions in a very uh, different manner than everything uh, was done before us. So before us, what people did is they evolved the stars in a code, okay, and then they get this pre supernova model, and then they essentially cut out the inner part, and then they put a piston in there, and then they assume that inner part, this becomes the uh, remnant, the neutron star black hole, and then they, they dial in an, some energy to the piston and then let it go, and then that's how explode a star. So basically, you could control everything, okay? You can put the piston anywhere you want, so you control the mass of the remnant, you dial in the energy, so you control the uh, explosion, and because of the, you're controlling the explosion energy, you also indirectly uh, control the explosive nuclear synthesis, too. So we're here, this time we decided, okay, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna give up that luxury of controlling everything, but instead we're gonna explode these stars through what's called engines, okay? So just to give you an idea, we use uh, actual observational data from two uh, well-known, well-studied supernovae, the supernova 87A and then supernova uh, 1054. So this is also as, as well as known as CRAB. And the reason is because we have uh, fairly well-measured explosion energies and the amount of uh, nuclear synthesis created during these explosions for these two cases. For 87As, of course, it's very precise. You know, even after this exploded, we even saw the uh, progenitor star. It was a blue supergiant, but of course, for the a crab supernova, we can't, you know, it happened 1,000 years ago, so we don't know what the progenitor is, but we have some ideas. So the uh, main idea for this new type of explosion was this. So we take some bunch of supernova models, pre-supernova models, okay, so there's just stars that just ready to die, and that could describe these two different supernovae. And then we cut out, again, we, you know, we do cut out, but we cut out small enough so that, you know, we will for sure know that all this matter goes in into a compact remnant. So we cut out that, 1.1 solar mass, and basically take this boundary and replace it with the analytical model of how the surface of the protein neutron star cools and contracts. Okay, so we have an analytical model of how this guy evolves in time. And then as it evolves in time, you know, it shrinks, it emits neutrinos, and we calculate how those neutrinos are, uh, you know, 
interact with the matter here and then how it explodes. Uh, but the important thing is as this contraction of the core, this analytical model has few uh, tunable knobs and we basically tune those using these uh, observational uh, values. Okay, so we basically then record how the history of how this boundary shrinks in all those explosions calibrated to this and then we call those engines and then we place those things inside all the other stars that we want to explode and then just sit back. Okay, so all we're doing is putting those engines inside and then let the star explosion do its own thing. And we don't control anything. We don't put any piston anywhere, like just random arbitrarily, or we don't dial in any energy. And as a result, uh, this is what it looks like. So what it's shown is uh, uh, explosion results. The blues are explosions. Blacks are implosions. Uh, so basically black holes form. This is neutron stars form for different engines. Okay, so these are all different engines uh, compiled here with increasing strength. So this is the weakest engine, this is the strongest engine, and they're all plotted as a function of initial mass. And you notice that for all, even for the weakest engine, all the stars below 15, you know, they for sure explode. But as you go, the higher mass, in general, it becomes much more complicated. So this is where the, you know, the islands are really visible. And, but in general, you see that below 20, mostly, you know, for the stronger engines, mostly stars explode. But there's a, also a very distinct uh, island around 26, okay? And I'll skip this part. Also, I'll skip this part. And uh, so after investigating the explosions, we also, uh, during the explosion, we also investigate the uh, compact remnants. So this is the uh, probability distribution function for all the compact remnants as we integrate these results from the population of explosions uh, through the IMF, the initial mass function. And this is the PDF, and this dashed uh, distribution is the observed count. And the, just to clarify, the, obs the observed count is not an actual PDF. It's just the, to give you a visual to the, uh, the diversity and range and median value for the uh, neutron star masses. So you see that it matches pretty nicely. And for the black holes, uh, the, the science of implosion is also a kind of an open problem. You know, we still don't understand. And there are kind of two possibilities. So when the star dies, when the star implodes, it, it, the whole thing can just implode and become and create a very massive black hole. Or as it implodes, the helium core, the, the part where there is no hydrogen, that implodes. But the envelope of the hydrogen, that might actually get ejected. And there are like several mechanisms proposed for doing that. Uh, so because of this you know, uncertainty, we actually calculate PDFs two ways. So this pink distribution is when you assume everything implodes, but this green one, when we assume the only helium core implodes. And as you can see, it actually matches pretty nicely with the observations if you assume that the envelope gets ejected. And these two black dots are, I don't know if you guys heard the recent uh, LIGO gravitational wave detections of two uh, low redshift black holes, and they were like seven and a half and 14 solar masses, also aiding you know, this nice distribution. And here is the nuclear synthesis result. Again, this is where all the uh, production of the nuclear synthesis of all these massive stars integrated over the IMF. And what's plotted here is as a function of atomic number, I'm plotting the production of these elements all normalized to the oxygen abundance in the sun. Okay, so all this complicated, what it really means is this line is where the solar values are as we measure in the sun. And if you can bring up all the elements in this band, you're basically explaining their origin. And, uh, but uh, just to clarify, not everything is, uh, massive stars are not responsible for everything in this graph. For example, these lightest elements, they're coming from the Big Bang nuclear synthesis, so like hydrogen, helium, lithium, we don't worry. And there's beryllium off axis here, and we don't worry because it's created later by a different process called cosmic ray spallation. Uh, but we worry elements from boron until about here. But we also don't worry this gap. This is called iron group gap. And the reason we don't worry is because most of the iron in the universe is actually created by the thermonuclear explosions of 1A supernovae. These are explosions of white dwarfs. Uh, massive stars create a lot of iron, but most of it actually comes from 1As. So if you put in the contribution from 1A, you can actually fill up this gap pretty nicely. So we don't worry. So notice that ignoring this iron group gap, you know, in the elements in this range, mostly things agree quite well, but there are you know, a lot of pieces there here and there they're deficient. But we worry a lot about this guy. So this is the, what's called the S process. That's, uh, so S process is uh, also a process 
of nucleosynthesis and uh, massive stars and also in low mass stars uh, to build heavy nuclei by capturing neutrons. Okay, so S stands for slow capture of neutrons. This compared to the beta decay. So there's two components. The weak component is the elements from essentially from iron until yttrium, and then the main component goes from yttrium to lead. Uh, so the main component is uh, really the small stars are responsible for these guys. So we don't worry, you know, uh, about these heavier uh, S-process elements, but we really worry about these guys because massive stars are solely responsible for these guys, the uh, production of these guys, and then you notice that they're seriously deficient. And this is actually a direct consequence of giving up that luxury of uh, exploding any star in any way you want. Because when you look at the older studies, you know, you could just put in the piston anywhere, dial in energy, and you could like match everything. <laughs> you know, but now you give up that luxury and make the stars, uh, the stellar explosions dependent on the progenitor structure, uh, you see that you know, things are much more complicated. Uh, finally, light curves. I'm almost done. Uh, so these are all the uh, type 2b light curves from all the explosions. They're all bundled together. So you have a shock breakout. There's a plateau, and then it's decreasing uh, to a radioactive tail. And you have a few type 1bcs. So all the biggest stars that lose a lot of mass, so they end up as type 1bc if they manage to explode. So they just rise and decline. And all the stars that create type 2p were smaller than 30 solar mass, and all the stars above uh, 30 solar mass, they create 1 BC, and that's because all the stars below 30 solar mass had some or a good fraction of the hydrogen envelope retained, and above 30 there was no hydrogen. And again, this 30 is not the magical number, it's all dependent on the assumptions of mass loss, which I said is very uncertain. So with different mass loss prescriptions, these numbers will be different. Anyways, we did some statistics and we find that 95% you know, of all explosions were you know, dying as type 2p supernovae, and then very few die as this. But then we found out that these type 1 BCs are very different than the usual type 1 BCs that we know. And actually, if you plot the usual type 1 BCs, they're just like a tiny blip. And these guys are much broader. And then it turns out these things have never been observed. And so we're kind of a, putting it as a prediction for this rare uh, broad uh, type 1 BC. And the reason why they're broad is because the progenitors are bigger. All right, let's get this. All right, just to sum up, I'm sorry, it's been a complicated talk. Uh, so basically, the main conclusion, if I had to say, is that uh, now we know for a fact that this compactness thing is extremely robust, that it's non-monotonic with initial mass. Okay, so I really believe in it. Even though there's, I know, I heard rumors that some experts, uh, you know, experts in the field have some doubts. So I'm planning to write more papers on this. Uh, so the reason why they become non-monotonic is also, I think, it's now well established. It's mostly due to the modulation of uh, different uh, shell and core burning episodes. And when you assume this kind of structure is true and then you do this explosion in this new way of, with the engines, you see that the uh, explosion energetics, you know, the remnant masses, they actually agree quite well with the observations. But the nucleus synthesis is a little bit problematic. And, uh, I think, but it's, it, being problematic is a good thing because I know my modeling is not perfect. You know, there are like rotational physics is missing. You know, uh, by the way, I didn't mention that all of my models don't rotate. Okay, but the real stars do rotate, and the rotation plays a role during the explosion too. And so this is the problem we eventually want to fix. And finally, I want to mention that you know we have this picture of islands of explosions where you know having this. Uh, islands around 20 and 26 solar mass, but they're actually people who measure uh, the progenitors of real supernovae, okay? So this guy compiled this bunch of uh, observations. So what you happen is, what you do is you observe a supernova, you, grab, you go back to archival image, and then find a star that happened to be in the same location for that uh, explosion. And then you fit some models, and then you get some uncertain idea about how big those stars were. And you notice that all the points that he compiled are all below 20. So there's kind of, as of, here, as of now, there's absolutely no evidence of you know, islands you know, doing anything. So because you know, these guys are very close to this region of you know, common explosion, it's really hard to differentiate with just a few points. But if there were points like around 26, that would be much more nice. So it's you know, a little bit depressing sometimes, but I'm happy that I'll just get my PhD anyway. So. <laughs> All right, and finally, I'm sorry, the very final thing that we release all of our data. 
And so all the presupernal models, all the explosion models, and all the nucleosynthesis yields, the light curves, and everything uh, publicly available. And we have, as of now, like almost half a dozen researchers across the globe using our data for all kinds of interesting work. All right, thank you. Yes, this is a big one. Sorry. Um, we have time for questions. Thank you, Tugelder. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, we have some questions. So you touched on this at the at the very end, but you, the previous slide you said your model was one dimensional. Yeah. And so, uh, in addition to spin, I'm wondering how what you know whether the effect of magnetic fields that are directional and convection within the uh, yes. uh, outer parts of the star would play in the final shape of the remnant of the you know nebula, mm -hmm. and given that you're sort of reverse engineering the explosion from a model of existing nebulas, but you're not taking those into effect. I was wondering if you, you think it's negligible or you just want to do a 3D model soon, or what's the plan? So uh, the way it works in the computational astrophysics is that, uh, so I, in the, and actually in one of the first slides, I mentioned that mass loss and convection are the biggest problems, right? So at least well understood. And part of the reason why they're not understood is because these processes are inherently multidimensional. Okay, so the convection behaves very differently if you simulate in 2D versus 3D. And in 1D, of course, you can simulate, so you have to, this kind of parametric model that, you know, that's what everybody uses, including me. Um, so because it's multidimensional, the only means of really understanding them is to do kind of self-consistent multidimensional uh, simulations. But those are super expensive. Uh, like if you think of in uh, 3D simulations, okay, so you just, the, even with the most powerful supercomputers, the amount of time that you uh, simulate the star is equivalent of just one human heartbeat in a human lifetime. And so even with the most powerful computers, you just only sim can simulate a very small you know, fraction of its life in a full 3D. So basically, because these things are very expensive, uh, people try to do all these kind of simplifications. They try to you know, take out some things, make it cheaper, and then try to extrapolate later. And, and as of now, this convection is really an open problem, and we still don't have an answer. And so another point I want to make in this regard is that there are a lot of people actually doing this, uh, where, the, where the big supercomputers are. They're really trying to make this uh, self-consistent simulations. This is also relevant for the problem of explosion, okay? And there are a lot of people doing that. But the problem is, even though these things can, uh, these three-dimensional simulations can capture all of the relevant physics, uh, they're just, because they're so expensive, it's like kind of meaningless to think about using them in the uh, population of supernovae, for example, okay? But you know, we see uh, abundances in the sun, we see neutron stars and uh, black holes, we can measure their masses, you know, we can build these distributions. To really explain that, uh, I think in, even in my lifetime, the only means is through this kind of a rather simplistic 1D. So this is kind of a different way of attacking problem uh, for our case is that instead of trying to make this very expensive computations, we just do like many, many 1D. So we did like thousands of different calculations. So with the, of course, doing 1D, you, know, you don't get to have this uh, uh, important physical effects, but you get to explore much wider parameter space. So in, in a lot of ways, it's uh, still a competing good way. So I hate to bring it back to 3D simulations, but I am curious about, um, do people still believe in neutrino rockets uh, that happen with supernova that give the star a kick after, you know, give the remnant a kick after? Yeah, so, yeah, I'm not really an expert. Now, you should really ask that question from the people who, who does the 3D simulations. And, but in my opinion, yes, yeah. So the neutron stars will get kick. Uh, we, we observe neutron stars with the velocities, so they must have kick. And, but I think the current trend is now going to the kicks is being mostly produced in a, uh, maybe a fallback supernovae. Those, uh, so fallback supernovae are the explosions, and then uh, as the shockwave goes out and it ejects the, um, uh, ejects the, um, uh, the material in, into space, but the inner part of the ejecta eventually falls back because it's kind of a failed explosion. Uh, that's a very good question. So in the fallback, that's, that becomes very hard. But it's my understanding that the, in the fallback situations, the kicks are slightly easier to obtain. 
On your um, atomic number chart, you only went out to 60, so you know we know the largest natural elements. Uh, yeah, right? that's right. So and it's quite abundant here on this planet, but it's also more abundant in the universe than some of the preceding elements. Mm -hmm. So it seems odd that the, the heaviest one would be in such abundance, why it should taper down. Is that maybe because a lot of uh, elements that are synthesized in a supernova are actually higher than uranium and they all decay down and pile up at the uranium uh, point? No, so, so there are d different processes work for the you know, heaviest elements. So the heaviest elements are really the R process elements. And R, so I mentioned about slow process. So there's another process, rapid capture of neutrons, that creates elements you know, higher than lead going up all the way to the heaviest elements. So the problem uh, is that, so just to be clear, our calculations don't do any R process nucleosynthesis, because that itself is a very complicated. And also, the other reason is the site of the R process is still an open question. We still don't quite know well where the R process actually happens. For a long time, people thought the massive stars are responsible for those heaviest elements, but now uh, actually the picture is changing, and it's actually the neutron star mergers that create the, most of the R process. So for that reason, we didn't do any R process. And just to clarify, uh, in, in the previous plot, sorry. Uh, the, so you're asking about why, why it just keep going down, right? So the reason, remember that this is plotted as normalized to uh, solar oxygen value. Okay, so the abundance measured in the sun is really here. So, uh, you know, if you had if you could include all the contributions from all the different sources, like small stars and type 1As and everything, and all the uh, neutron star mergers, then everything should line up here. This is the solution that we're looking for. Okay, and because, just want to clarify that, because it's normalized to oxygen, this part doesn't mean, you know, it's, uh, in nature, that's uh, fewer. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, that's just what I say. I don't know if that answers. Okay. Okay. I'd like to close by uh, presenting to Gulder with our traditional mug as a token of thanks for uh, sharing his research with us today. Thank so you so much. Let's thank to Gulder one more time. Thank you.